Hey, uh, hey, uh, uh, Andrew? Uh-huh. Uh, so, yeah? Uh, I'm here now. You're here? Like, what, what time is it? it this is 2008, January, January 1st, the 10th day of the month. Wait, 2008? It is 2008. Did I, like, go into a time warp? Why do I know you? <laughs> this is 2008. <laughs> 2008. I don't know why you know me. It's back in time. This is Control Structure, episode 138, January 11th, 2018. A big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs138 to see them. I am your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Good morning, Andrew. Good evening, Stephen. It's all based on perspective of what time zone you're referring to. I'm pretty sure it's not 2008 anywhere on Earth. <laughs> well, time travels slower in some places, so it's hard um, to say. Yeah, maybe if you're around a black hole or something. Okay, fair enough. So, so, hey, we're trying a new podcast format. So, you know, all the blabbering and stuff that we do about ourselves, that's now in the fringe. So go ahead and see a little note for that. And, uh, yeah, listen if you wish. So, uh, do you happen to run an operating system on an Intel CPU? It says Intel Core i7 V Pro inside. Oh no. You are totally screwed. In fact, pretty much everyone is totally screwed. Basically. <laughs> um, so, there's. Uh, how do you say? There's a variety of attacks that. Um, allow a program on your machine to uh, exfiltrate uh, data from either other programs or from the kernel itself. So uh, this flaw apparently goes back uh, for like 20 or 30 years, maybe forever. Let's just assume forever. Uh, that due to the design of CPUs that uh, it can be uh, effectively... Uh, a side channel attack on essentially timing. So, you know, like when you're writing a program, you know, things are supposed to execute one after the mm -hmm. other and fetch from memory this and that. Well, that's how should I say, in concept that's true, but in reality, there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on behind the scenes that makes it really, really fast. So, uh, there's out of order execution, Speculative, uh, was it speculative execution, mm -hmm. uh, and like operator reordering? So, uh, like stuff, how should I say, stuff ahead of where the program is can start executing under certain conditions. Like, you know, if this stuff down here does not depend on anything that I'm doing right now, you can start calculating that and fetching. Uh, like, more stuff in from RAM that will probably be needed uh, soon. Uh, so, like, all of that takes time. Uh, so, like, if you can figure out how long something takes, you can effectively figure out, uh, like, how, uh, or rather, if something was fetched from memory, depending on how long it takes a certain branch of code to execute. And, you know, if if that is speculatively executed, then uh, you can figure out, oh, like, this was, you know, uh, fetched from memory and, you know, this condition was true and stuff, which you can exfiltrate one bit at a time from RAM. So it takes a long time, but thankfully computers don't mind doing the same thing a gazillion times. And quickly. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, there are two big ones, uh, two big variants of this called Meltdown, which affects, uh, like, a wider range of CPUs, especially Intel ones, uh, because the proposed patch to flush out all of this, you know, cached memory and, you know, stop this speculative execution, uh, may slow down, depending on what you do, 
may slow down performance by around 30%. Which is fairly significant. Yes, and, uh, you know, our favorite database, Postgres, uh, the benchmark for that uh, shows slowdowns of, like, 15 and 20%. So, you know, again, depending on what you're doing, uh, it may or may not, you know, slow it down as much. Uh, gaming uh, is actually not affected as much, uh, according to, uh, you know, Linux benchmarks uh, from, I think it was Pharonix. But, uh, yeah, uh, then there's uh, Spectre, uh, which pretty much affects all CPUs, uh, which is just another variant of that, uh, which is the application, to, which is the program-to-program -program isolation, whereas Meltdown is the kernel uh isolation bug so you know it seems that a lot of that well a lot of this it seems that all of this can be cured by uh particular uh software patches uh which band-aid yeah uh but i think like the proper thing would be for uh you know better designed cpus uh let's see uh and then, yeah, because, uh, how should I say, Intel was really hit by, you know, Meltdown. Apparently, AMD processors are not affected because of uh, how they are designed, which uh, makes my Ryzen 1800X look pretty good right mm -hmm. now. Uh, so, you know, because they have, you know, pretty well-performing CPUs that, uh, you know, really aren't affected by this, it means AMD stock is going up. And then Intel released that thing about it doesn't let, allow you to uh, corrupt or do write to or delete any of the memory. Yeah. So we're fine, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, you don't really need to corrupt or delete or do anything with data. I can just steal your private key and mess you up that way. Uh, I thought that was really funny. <laughs> like, wait a second. <laughs> so uh, uh, let's see. So then uh, you know, Microsoft is starting to uh, you know, release... Uh, patches for this uh, so uh, like so apparently one of these patches that Microsoft released uh, sort of stopped booting you know like these older AMD CPUs oh, really? like the really early like AMD 64 based CPUs oh, a long time ago yeah uh, apparently if they were running Windows 10 well they might not be anymore <laughs> Because Linux. of uh, because of apparently faulty documentation from AMD, and it is suspected that uh, it's because these Microsoft patches are trying to execute instructions that were not implemented on those. So uh, then, was it LWN.net has a a very nice you know layout of you know what this bug is, uh, mm -hmm. and like how how exactly it works, which, you know, uh, you know, I, you know, just read it, you know, rather thoroughly, uh, you know, just before the show. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm starting to understand, you know, what in the world's going on. I like the, the Raspberry Pi one that you found. Uh, that one was good at uh, explaining well, the but it is what? what? Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! So I can't yell out loud because that pops your microphone out or something so yeah yeah I, it's not very much fun anymore <laughs> we have a raspberry <laughs> we do have a raspberry <laughs> so apparently the first generation raspberry pies aren't affected by any of these so they're gonna be so much faster right yeah so much faster than they used to yes <laughs> by comparison to intel <laughs> <laughs> so uh you know raspberry the Raspberry Pi Foundation, you know, released a blog post explaining why uh, it's not affected by Spectre or Meltdown, and I think it does a pretty good job of breaking down what in the world out of order execution, speculative execution, and like caching, you know, mm -hmm. is. Yeah, it's good for basic terminology, just like seeing where it's at. So, and then another thing is that, uh, like. Uh, how to say I like when I was uh, you know just browsing hacker news that this all kind of exploded when I think it was someone at AMD submitted a patch saying that 
uh, you know, like AMD CPUs aren't affected by this bug, so we don't need to, you know, engage this behavior on AMD processors. So they're like, uh, why are you doing that? <laughs> so that's when it started to blow up really bad. Mm. So, but, uh, you know, maybe, you know, because your CPU has, you know, slowed down by up to 30%, you might want to, say, increase your GPU speed. Uh, like, maybe by getting a chip with uh, AMD graphics. Hey, AMD isn't affected by this, right? So... Uh, if you recall, I think it was, we mentioned on last show that, uh, uh, AMD and Intel came to an agreement to put AMD GPUs and integrate them into Intel CPUs, like in the same, like, sort of chip, Mm -hmm. which we finally know more about those. So, uh, I believe they're the, uh, models are going to be released, uh, have a eighth generation core CPU with uh, Vega RX Vega graphics, and uh, so like the TDP. Yeah, we watched that uh, Linus video that says you know the total power of this chip is going to be like a hundred watts, uh, uh, at least the higher end model and overclockable, uh, with a sort of smaller low power of like sixty five watt, uh, like another chip. But uh, yeah, this should allow. You know, gaming in like laptops and small boxes, uh, quite a bit more than uh, uh, actual Intel integrated graphics, uh, because of the high bandwidth memory chip right next to it. So, back to AMD, uh, they do have vulnerabilities, uh, but another one is the platform security processor, which, uh, like you um, asked in the fringe. Like what is used for, and is this, and oh. at least the uh, Intel version uh, is uh, like when a company has like a whole bunch of computers and like cubicles and stuff, and they want to manage those. Like the Intel version of this, you know, allows that. So uh, apparently, there was uh, a vulnerability discovered in this platform security processor. So AMD looks like it's releasing. Uh, like new BIOS versions that might, that should disable this little security processor that you can't audit or get into or anything. Hmm. And now for this episode's LOL Apple. <laughs> Does your iPhone make any slower, Andrew? Uh, yeah. Why? Well, I, I just wondered. Maybe it's because the battery is going bad. Well, maybe, but, you know, if if you're trying to say, you know, it's like, oh, there's a new faster iPhone, you know, that doesn't really make mine any slower, does it? Do you know what I think when my phone starts getting slower? I think it's time to change the battery. <laughs> That's a good idea, <laughs> especially when it just starts, you know, turning off randomly. So, uh... The guys over at Geekbench, which is, you know, essentially a benchmark, uh, I'm not sure, company, I guess, uh, they've, you know, gone back into their benchmarks and sort of, you know, looked at these benchmarks again. Because, you know, hey, we have this hardware lying around, we Mm -hmm. might as well, you know, run all of our hardware in order to heat up our place in the winter. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's really cold. It's It's an efficient form of heating. Yes. So... Uh, they took a, took a look at the iPhone 6s when it was released, and uh, you know they took a look at this and then scores you know throughout time, and it looks like um, some of them are getting slower, uh, some of them a lot slower, and you know same thing happened with the iPhone 7, that you know most of them are you know up at the top you know, and then after a while you can start to see some separation. Well, it turns out that Apple has been intentionally slowing down CPU speeds. So when people say that their phone is slower when they upgrade their operating system or when a new phone comes out, they're not wrong. <laughs> you know, you know because, you know, a piece of hardware should stay at the same performance like for, you know, all time and not like having it intentionally, you know, get mm-hmm. slower. 
You know, what, what is this, 2018? Of course it slows down. Get with the program. <laughs> it's just because you don't have the best phone that you should probably buy. Uh, so uh, Apple got a lot of heat for this, and they are now offering battery placements on select models hmm. for $30, as opposed to, like, the 70 or 80 they were charging. In other words, the models that they think that you're allowed to still have, but the old ones that you should upgrade, you should still upgrade those ones. Yeah. Uh, so this cryptocurrency and blockchain fad is going too far. I'm going to go on the record to say that this is the next big bubble. Big problem is where does the bubble go when it pops? Yeah. Like how much further is this going to go? Mm -hmm. And like we sort of mused on the fringe, you know, like what's going to happen or like when. It's like, well, I have a feeling that a bunch of formerly rich people are going to jump out of windows. <laughs> like like actual glass windows on the outside of buildings kind of windows. Um, oh, they aren't going to install Linux? Uh, they might be running Macs, but I highly... Uh, they could be running Macs. Yeah, I highly doubt these financial executives will be running Linux. <laughs> so, uh, I've heard of Long Island Iced Teas before. Uh, I didn't really know that there is a company called Long Island Iced Tea Corp., uh, they changed their name to Long Blockchain and announced a whole bunch of blockchain-related things, and their stock immediately shot up. Because obviously it's a gold mine. Yeah. So. I mean, look how fast the stocks went up. That yeah. shows you how good of stock it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, got to get on those new valuations, yo. So, uh, let's see. This was just announced today. Apparently Kodak is getting into, what? like, Bitcoin mining and stuff. Seriously? Yeah. Kodak? Yeah. The the photo camera company. They're, like, the last company that still makes film. Uh, so, Kodak One uh, will allow photographers to publish and register their rights in digital photographs on an immutable blockchain. <laughs> it, it, it was convenient timing when they, they be, became that. Yeah. Interesting. Kodak. Kodak. Coin. Yeah, we've got to put that in there. Kodak coin. So. Something one is a big buzzword now with companies. Yeah. It's uh, like my company. It's company name one is the name of their the new platform. that. Well, there's Xbox the One, mm -hmm. but Microsoft is more in the 365 business now. I guess. So I wouldn't can't be just happy with one. They have to have lots of them. Yeah. I would not be surprised if the next Xbox is called Xbox 365. Anyways, so with all this mining going on, GPU prices are getting more expensive over time. So uh, the handy folks over at uh, Maximum PC, uh, you know, display, you know, got a handful of, you know, relatively recent model graphics cards and compared the launch price compared to the price in November mm. compared to the price now. Uh, so, yeah, and for all of them, it looks like the prices are going up. Like, especially the RX 570 launched at $199. It is now $246. Wow. So uh, that's, like, more than doubled. I was putting me in memory. I forget the article, what bank it was, this was like maybe beginning of this Bitcoin fad, like right before it became mainstream. There was an article about a bank in Russia had bought a whole bunch of graphics cards and there was a shortage on them. They're like, we're just experimenting with cryptocurrency. We're not actually <coughs> mining cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in all of this, I have decided to sell my GPU uh, to my pastor to play games on. You think? Uh, I'm not joking. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm pretty sure he's not using it <laughs> because uh, he hasn't bought a new computer yet okay. to you know play the game he wants to play on it. I see. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and then I went on and bought a, uh, a Radeon seventy seven seventy for thirty five dollars. It was a buy it now thing, so I bought it now because <laughs> I thought that was a steal, and it's kind of worked out. So, you remember Google Chrome Apps? Uh, or at least the Chrome Web Store? I remember 
there was a, uh, it was kind of like, are you familiar with Postman? So, UI. Ah, uh, yeah. It was kind of like an in-web browser uh, web testing tool, and it, I think it was a Chrome app. It was like the only one yeah, that was used. So, apparently, Chrome had a web store app or something, or, yes, yeah, store for web apps or something. Um, well, it must have been in beta because it's shut down now. Maybe. Or shut in down, uh, at least for most platforms. Well, that's how Google does everything. They kill it eventually. Yeah. So, uh, apparently they killed it for everything except Chrome OS. Hmm. So, yeah. I guess that's going downhill. So, uh, so when you have, you know, these web apps and stuff, you're in the cloud, except you actually need a connection to yes. this, to the cloud. And it turns out that even though DSL sucks, you can run it over wet string. I've used DSL for years. <laughs> and at some times, it probably was a wet string. It could have been. So uh, someone actually got some string and got it wet with uh, salt water and uh, got it going over what it looks like 10 or 20 feet of twine. Which is downright <laughs> impressive. And it actually went. Uh, looks like he was getting like three and a half megabits. There's, there's an internet tech for you. He can make anything fake internet. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have fiber at my house. I I signed up with the cable company, and uh, I they came and connected up, and uh, it's actually a fiber line. Wow. So it's, it's not like blazing it's, fast. It's but not, it's, is it Fios or no? I don't know. It's right. some sort of fiber. Um, hmm. It's through um, come the name of the company. Okay. Well. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> it's through that cable company. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, did you buy anyone an Amazon Echo? I did not buy anyone an Amazon Echo. Amazon did give me one, though, once we were writing com- some code. Other than that. Really? Yes, I-, I wrote the skill for them back in June, and they sent me a free Echo. Huh. Or sometime well, back in that month. Well, don't do that, because it spies. Uh, the S in IoT is, stands for security, etc. Security, etc. <laughs> um, and apparently... Amazon Echo might be spewing ads soon. Uh, at least uh, Amazon is looking for uh, new ad space now that Google has taken over the internet. So yeah, you gotta take, get your ads in some place. So, and due to the ongoing feud between Google and Amazon mm-hmm. and stuff, and Walmart, yeah. And so, so yeah, it's <clears throat> yeah. So uh, Walmart runs its cloud stuff on. Microsoft Azure, ah, and I think they just recently announced a deal with Google to put you know Walmart stuff on Google, uh, Walmart products that is. Okay, so that is going to full fledged feud there. Yeah, so sides are lining up. So meanwhile, Amazon is looking at signing uh, deals with, uh, say, Procter and Gamble and like other like household product companies. So like Alexa might suggest buying. Clorox branded bleach when like you ask it's better bleach so you should <laughs> probably buy that yeah as as opposed to that scummy Aldi brand bleach yeah I mean bleach is clearly better <laughs> it's not like it's the same chemical <laughs> yeah definitely so uh, you're sort of a fan of old games I am uh, I, I like the old ones that play the weird sounds and yes. the big blocky graphics and, and more simple more simple times. Well, now you can play some more recent model games uh, because Scum VM 2.0 has been released, uh, offering support for a whole bunch of 32-bit Sierra adventures um, and other 32-bit adventures like Riven. It had quite an impressive list. You play Winnie the Pooh. Uh, what were the other ones? Winnie the Pooh and uh, Doctor Seuss. Doctor Seuss. Oh, yeah. Mickey Mouse goes to space. Yeah, like, it has everything in there. Yeah. So yeah, check it out if you have some uh, floppies or something lying around. So you know, as I mentioned to you before, uh, this is not an emulator uh, because, like, you know, that uh, Unreal Engine. Uh, Let's see, CryEngine, uh, Unity, like these are all like en- you know like bits of code that you shove your assets, your textures, your models and stuff into, and like you know plays your game essentially. So ScumVM 
is that except for older games. So, you know, like uh uh like as you were saying, like the dot net standard mm-hmm. and then there's implementations. Well this is essentially an implementation of a lot of game engines uh from the past. So you can, you know, run things on your uh you know Raspberry Pi that that originally ran on your four eighty six. I was thinking through kind of versus DOS box. DOS box you yeah, it's, have the extra layer. Yeah, it's senior. it's more of a compatibility layer, or it's more closer mm-hmm. to emulation than this is. Because when you play older games, you couldn't possibly sacrifice any frames. Yeah, you got to see it. And the, the glory of the modern four hundred frames per second, <laughs> or or four thousand frames 4, per second. 000. In which case, your game runs way too like, fast. I just started the game and it's over. <laughs> Hey, uh, so then uh, Crytek sues Cloud Imperium Games because it's not using its vanilla CryEngine anymore. Hey, CryEngine, we just mentioned that. <laughs> so uh, Crytek, uh, which has made uh, games ending or that have the word cry in them, Far Cry, Crisis, uh, and others. Uh, so you know they made this. You know, rather impressive engine called Cry Engine, and then uh, like ten years later, Chris Roberts comes along and uh, wants to use it to make this beautiful space simulator game. Uh, so, uh, and then along comes Amazon, which has apparently bought the rights to use uh, Cry Engine and coupled that with uh, Amazon Web Services. And because uh, Star Citizen was using a lot of cloud stuff with Google, they're like, hey, this is a better deal. You know, going here provides the engine code and the uh, cloud infrastructure for us. So they switched over, and apparently Crytek is not too happy yet, happy about it. That and Crytek is kind of uh, close to bankruptcy right now. Uh-huh. So, uh, let's see... So uh, Amazon's uh, engine is called Lumberyard, uh, which itself is part of the complaint. However, the game licensing agreement says that the defendants, uh, Cloud Imperium, uh, have a license only to exclusively embed CryEngine in the game. Uh, CIG also failed to provide Crytek with promised bug fixes and optimizations that emerged from its use. Also at issue is the development of Squadron 42, a single-player component of Star Citizen. Uh, Cloud Imperium announced early in 2016 that it will be available for purchase separately, which, in Crytek's opinion, denotes it as a separate game. But the agreement only had granted the developers the right to use the engine in one game, and by splitting them up, uh, Crytek says that they are intentionally and willfully using CryEngine without a license and in violation of copyright laws. Which, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but... It kind of sounds like they might have a point. So uh, then Cloud Imperium files back a motion for dismissal, saying that it should never have been filed in the first place. Uh, And uh, Cloud Imperium says that the agreement doesn't look like it quite backs up Crytek. Uh, For instance, uh, you know, claims it uses in two games, but the GLA treats Squadron 42 as part of Star Citizen. At a glance, there isn't anything to suggest that Cloud Imperium had to use CryEngine either. It just gave the studio rights to use it, but did not stop them from switching. Uh, As for the allegations that CIG has not promoted Crytek or CryEngine enough, uh, Cloud Imperium argues that, as Crytek itself points out, it is not using Crytek software anymore, so there's no need to display the trademarks (laughs) for it. Quite a good point. Uh, But, you know, the twist is, is that Lumberyard is based off of CryEngine, so, like, there was, like, hardly any refactoring they needed to oh, do. Oh, so it was super easy to change over. Yes. So what happened? Did Amazon buy CryEngine, or Amazon's licensing it through them, but super cheaper or something? Uh, through them, I think. And I'm not sure. It's it's kind of hard to tell, like, if they, like, licensed it as, like, a white label so they could put their own name on it hmm. for some reason. So that's interesting, because then if the CryEngine company goes out of business, if that's the foundation for Lumberyard, do you just stop, or did Amazon buy the source code? Yeah. Uh, that's that's what I've been thinking for a while, that uh, like it was like maybe two or three years ago 
that Crytek was actually having trouble paying its employees for, like, uh-huh. a few months. So, and then that's when Cloud Imperium came by and opened up a studio in Germany, which is where Crytek is, and, like, hired a whole bunch of people that used to work at See. Crytek. So, like, I'm not exactly sure if that's, like, a like bad blood between them or what. Mm. Uh, but, you know... <clears throat> But apparently Crytek received additional funding, and uh, then when I heard that Amazon was doing this lumberyard thing, I'm like, why doesn't Amazon just buy Crytek? Like, you know, yeah. Amazon is trying to break into gaming. They bought Twitch. Oh, so, really? Yeah. Which may or may not happen in the past year, but oh well. Uh, so, like, if they were really serious about, you know, getting into the game development, Crytek would probably be a good choice, I think. Uh, but since... You know, Lumberyard has been out for a year and a half. I'm thinking that Amazon just might buy them in the liquidation sale. Just when when they go when they go under, yeah, yeah that, that would make sense. That might be a strategy they're seeing the writing on the wall. They're like, we got have what we need. We're just wait for you to go. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, Crichton's Crichton Python is great, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's so great. Would you like to use it in Excel? Uh. It would be good if I wanted to script anything in Excel. So far, I've never really even done much more than, like, once in Excel because it uses VB, which is kind of horrible. Yeah. So, uh, apparently there is a a feature suggestion uh, on the official Excel user voice website, and it has gained quite a bit of traction. I like the the voice thing that uh, Microsoft's doing now. I've seen that before for Visual Studio. Uh, where they vote on different features and stuff, which is pretty neat that you can do that. So in the list of top ideas, it is at the top by a very large margin. (laughs) So uh, almost 4,600 votes. The next one, 1,300. Yeah, that's quite a big margin. And uh, this is probably a good time to talk about uh, you don't always listen to your customers. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, kind of. Um, So yeah... I guess, I guess, yeah, if we want to talk about that now. It, it sure. just crossed my mind that it, that it like, fits perfectly. So I uh, came across an article recently that uh, yeah, went back into the history of the auto industry. And, uh, like, you know, when the car companies, you know, went and asked their customers, you know, what do you want uh, in these new cars? Uh, like they did things like make this two-door sports car a four-door. And so, like, okay, sounds good. So they did that, and those, like, they only did that for, like, three years because those models did not sell very well. So they switched back to the previous design, and it sold just fine. Imagine that. (laughs) When, in reality, they already had that car that they wanted. It it was, like, another uh, line. It was, like, another name of car, Mm -hmm. another model. So in that case, I'm not sure what the uh, Python version of Excel is. See, I, I'm not sure if there's exactly a one-to-one, but it's just the idea that what the customer wants isn't always necessarily what's best for them. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that if they, in Microsoft, implement, implements it in Python, it, it might not be a, a, a bad thing necessarily. I just found it interesting. Because you always think that, like in software and stuff, it's like, oh yeah, the user knows what they want. But not always do they know what they want. Not always do they understand what they're asking for. Because people are never happy. There's always a trade-off. And that's a good example of trade-offs in software, too. Is when you do something, there's always a trade for what you do. So Yeah, and I want to uh, show you a clip from The Simpsons that's essentially that. Okay. You know, like with the uh, you know car with too many features. <laughs> um, so, and then, you know, you could always go back to... You know, like Henry Ford's quote of, you know, like back when he, before he made the Model T, you know, if some, you know, someone asks like, well, what do people want? Well, they want a faster horse. Uh-huh. <laughs> See, that's a, that's a good example. They don't know that they want a car. Yeah. They don't know that they need a car. They just want a faster horse. Mm-hmm. So that they have no idea. And by horse, they mean way of getting around. But you have to in- decode what they're what they're saying. Exactly. That, that's a really good one. So it looks like you can't put GeForce cards in a data center. 
at least for non-blockchain purposes, or at least deploy drivers in a data center according to the license agreement. So if I just install them with a bash script, then fine. Mm, maybe. Or you would have to like do it manually or something. <laughs> you have a rubber duck. Yeah, you could have a rubber duck, you know, just do do do. <laughs> of course, I'm not exactly sure how a rubber duck would do that, but well, the I I haven't looked into it too much, but apparently it's like a USB keyboard that just types a certain set of things. So you just plug into the USB port and it starts typing <laughs> automatically, apparently. Or hook up the GPIO pins of a Raspberry Pi or something. I suppose you could do something <laughs> like that too. So we've we've uh, mentioned that the OpenWRT project and the Lead project are merging, and it looks like that's finally coming together. Uh, so it looks like they're they are just uh, going to be using the Lead code base from now on, and uh, maybe they will merge the Qualcomm FastPath stuff, which is uh, hardware acceleration for NAT traversal. Mm. So, uh, remember James Damore? That would be the guy that uh, was trying to explain how Google is actually quite contradictory because they say that they want diversity and ideas and, and all this stuff, but then they, they, they somehow seem Obviously to think certain, dis- yeah. certain ideas and perspectives should not be held. Yes, and, and apparently certain kinds of people should not uh, be there either. Uh, so, yeah, James Damore did his little memo thing and got fired... Uh, for, like, spreading misinformation about gender or whatever. Uh, So he's filing a lawsuit accusing Google of systematic illegal discrimination against conservatives and white men. Uh, So, you know, in the memo he uh, pointed out, and, you know, it does not surprise me in the least. In fact, I kind of expect, uh, you know, Silicon Valley companies, especially big ones, you know, to have you know, these courses and classes and stuff mm. that are specifically only for particular groups of people and that, you know, exclude, say, white people or men. It was interesting in the, the court case, they were giving other examples of just the different ways Google has uh, has spoken out against people. And if, if this is a different employee, this is uh, uh-huh. this year. In one case, uh, a Google employee wrote, in an internal company message board that if I had a child, I would teach him slash her traditional gender roles and patriarchy from a young age. Our degenerate society constantly pushes the wrong message. And then it says uh, the Google HR responded by writing to the employee that your choice of words could suggest that you are advocating for a system in which men work outside the home and women do not, or that you are advocating for a rigid adherence to gender identity at birth. We trust that neither is what you intended to say. <laughs> it's like, change your mind or shut up. <laughs> yeah. Basically what they're saying. Uh, but yeah, so not at all are they open to ideas or people talking. They just think that their idea is the way. Yes. Uh, you could say that they're Nazis in a way. That they, yeah, except for, at least, at least the bad thing is you get fired, but, uh, <laughs> in, in, yeah. So, and now Kickstarter. Uh, remember the Northerner Symphony by Jeremy Soule? Uh, this, actually, this is more of, uh, uh, Utah Chris thing. Okay. This is, I didn't remember it. Yeah. This is, like, from, like, a long time ago, like, five years ago. Uh, so, uh, like, you know, uh... I should say, uh, the Elder Scrolls games. Uh, those are the ones with the maps, and you can go to the different places in the maps, like different world. Or is that a different one? That might be a different one. Okay. So, uh, the Elder Scrolls games, uh, the music is written by Jeremy Soule. So, back when everyone was doing the Kickstarter thing, he's like, you know, I would kind of like to do a symphony. Aha. Uh-huh. So he went on there and raised, like, a lot more than he wanted to, like like one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and uh, he's been pretty quiet for the last five years. Um, so for Christmas, uh, he released a in progress sketches version of the symphony. Uh, this is not the final symphony, but it still sounds amazing. Uh, I've been listening to it almost constantly for about three weeks. There's just little bits and pieces of it that he's had an orchestra run through. Uh, yeah, he's uh, like digitally composing it. So you know, so he it's like a MIDI file that he's playing. 
uh, a very fancy uh, okay. MIDI setup, actually. Because, uh, uh, like, I remember, like, ten years ago for, I think it was, like, the Elder Scrolls Four, and I think also uh, Supreme Commander, that I remember an interview from him from, like, way back when, mm-hmm. that he says, what you are actually listening to is about 35 Pentium 4 processors. <laughs> <laughs> Three, and five. yeah and those like i guess must have been like sampled music like you know some like he actually got a lot of samples of musicians uh-huh. playing various notes and okay. stuff so it actually sounds real so it's the real notes he's just spliced like a lot of pitching together them, like pitching them a uh, little bit okay interesting hmm. and it sounds real you know, like, at no point have I ever thought, like, yeah, this is totally fake and synthetic. Uh-huh. It's not like the dee 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 is the sound that you get with the MIDI files. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. It, it's on the other side of the uncanny valley. Huh, very nice. Uh, so, you know, I can, I can sort of understand why he says, like, yeah, I want to put some more stuff in here, here and there. But, like, parts of it sound exactly like I'm playing Skyrim all over again. So that's why he's able to uh, pre-release it, because he's probably just tweaking it and adjusting it and fine-tuning it. Yeah. It's a neat thing about digital uh, art, in a sense, is you can... Uh, it's nothing to release it partway through. Yeah. So I want to do the MIDI, MIDI player out of floppy drives. <laughs> that's on my list. I The other day, I acquired, uh, for free, two USB floppy drives. I was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> Oh, you might need to, you know, disassemble those a little bit. Maybe. I might use them to play old floppy drive games or something. Okay. Perhaps, maybe someday. And now for more Kickstarter. Uh, Star Citizen. Hey, we talked about Star Citizen. Yeah, we were talking about landing on moons and yeah. planets and things. And... and then there was a lawsuit and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, Star Citizen Alpha 3.0 released with a whole bunch of stuff and planetary landings. So, yeah, we mentioned that back in the Fringe. So, yeah, that was uh, pretty cool. If you are a backer, you owe yourself to check this out. Like, you need to go and play this. Like, it is amazing. You can fly out of a space station, like, warp over to a moon, go down there, land, walk out, look around. It's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, let's see, the Nexus uh, had a year-end New Year's special, which actually covered, like, two points in this. But, you know, hey, it's nice to mention and go over things. Uh, so, yeah, if you uh, have any feedback, uh, go ahead and do that on the Nexus.tv. Uh, and don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your stuff, like Star Citizen and stuff. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I guess that's it, right? Yep. And now for the thing we do at the end of the show. 